Welcome to our Portions Podcast, where we discuss the portions of Scripture that are being read in the synagogues around the world each and every week. The goal and desire of these podcasts are that you would not only learn and be encouraged by the Scripture, but also that your heart would be enlarged where Israel and the Jewish people are concerned. So I ask you to open your Bible and open your heart, and I pray that over the course of the next 20 minutes, that the God of Israel would meet us as we study His Word together. So much for joining our Portions podcast this week. We have gotten some wonderful reports from all of you who have heard the podcast in the past. And this week is going to be no different because I have a super special guest with me. His name is Dan Juster. He currently serves as the leader of the Tikkun Network, director of Tikkun International, a friend of mine and a father in the Messianic movement around the world. Dan, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Very nice to be with you, Scott. It's, it's, so, it's so cool because one of the privileges I have with these podcasts is talking to leaders around the world. And when we were setting this up, your name uh, definitely was at the top of our list. So it, it just means a lot that you're with us and taking time away from your busy schedule. Well, bro, in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, we have a, a very interesting and a wonderful Parsha or portion um, from the scriptures. And that portion is out of Genesis 37, 1 to 40, 23. And it's on uh, Joseph. And if you could tell me, am I pronouncing this correctly, Vayashev? Yes, that's very good. Vayashev. Can you tell us what Vayashev means and how it's And related? he dwelt. Well, and dwelt, but that it's, uh, and he dwelt, or the person's name who dwelt. Okay. It comes from the verb meaning, it's the same verb as to sit, but when it's put in that context, it means to dwell somewhere. And so it's interesting that in, in, the, in the biblical Torah, the, the name of Parshas, as your audience probably knows listening to this, is oftentimes the first word in the verse that introduces the Parsha, whether it's a particularly good title or not, that's the word that's used. And so dwelt is um, the nature of it. Wonderful. And who is it talking about that's dwelling in this particular well, portion? Well, well, we're reading about what happened uh, to Joseph when Isaac was dwelling in the land. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we're reading about some amazing things because, you know, if I could say this, Genesis constantly puts together two themes that don't seem to go together. <laughs> One of the ult the ultimate freedom of human beings to do good and evil, yeah, and for God even and for God even to say, he, you know, he he regretted that he made man or or he was disappointed in this and that, which makes God very human-like, you know, because we can only speak of God in human terms. That's the only terms we have. Yeah. But then we read this other thing, which is the overarching control of God that's going to bring everything about as he wants it to be brought about. So amazing, and, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's really an amazing thing. So, yeah, so, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the writer is pretty pretty sophisticated in 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 the overall picture we get from the whole book of Genesis, and this fits right into it. Yeah, wonderful. Well, this this starts off, obviously, in Genesis 37.1, where Joseph, who is really the favored son of his father, has this amazing and remarkable dream. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the dream. And then in the blog that you wrote, which I'm so glad is up on our site, you, you, there's a sentence in there, and, and the sentence goes like this, but Joseph's foolishness is used by God and reveals to us his providential purposes. Maybe you can talk a little bit about Joseph's dream and how he was foolish in the way he let everybody know about it. Well, you know, Joseph's a young man, and he knows, no doubt, that his father favors him because he's the firstborn of his favorite wife. Yeah. Uh, and... So I'm sure growing up, there was some tension in that. So if you have a dream, the essence of which is that your your brothers and your father and your family and all of you, them are going to bow down to you and you're going to have an ascendant position over them, 
that's certainly not a good way to gain their favor <laughs> and to uh, cover over the, you know, to, to mitigate against the intense uh, competition and jealousy that was there. It doesn't seem like um, uh, Yitzhak, uh, you know, Jacob was was very brilliant. Yaakov was very brilliant in the way he handled that problem. And so um, now you have this intense uh, almost hatred growing up against him. Mm. And he he has this dream that his brothers are going to be bowing down to him and he shares it with everyone and it actually it actually cost him <laughs> tremendously for sharing it. So I'm going to ask you a question and um, I, I would love to hear your response on this. Do you think uh, he should have shared the dream or not? No, I, I don't think morally and wisdom wise he would have shared the dream and maybe God would have rescued Israel in a different way. Maybe they would come down to Egypt in a different way. But this is this is the amazing thing about it. That foolishness, this is the you know, wrong decision. The brother's decision was the wrong decision. They fell Joseph into Egypt and he has great suffering. But the whole thing is God's control. Incredible. It's a means by which Joseph, after his suffering, eventually attains the leadership of the land of Egypt under Pharaoh, and it's the key to saving his whole family, and they all do bow down to him. So, you know, the story is just amazing in terms of the fulfillment of the dream and and God's um, overarching, we say providence, his overarching providence is amazing in the book. I, I really love that because it's, it, it's very, very true that even when we blow it, but our hearts are after the Lord, he takes what the enemy meant for evil and really turns it to good. It doesn't, it doesn't give us license to purposefully choose the wrong thing and think that we're not going to have repercussions. But because God loves us so much and really sees the intent of our hearts, ultimately his desires are going to come about even if we mess up, which is, uh, that's actually quite encouraging to me. Just even reading through this, yeah. that as you say, God's overriding purposes will be fulfilled. And we ask the question of, how does he do that? How can God do that? And we see that, by the way, in the other intro story there. Uh, it, you know, we, we come to the end of this week and we're saying, no, don't end it there. You know, yeah, what's yeah. going on to how the story ends, right? right? And of course, in my exposition, I gave a little indication of how the story ends because you couldn't just leave everybody hanging. Right. But 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 the other, the other one is also clear. I mean, the, the writer of Genesis, must be aware, and I think it was Moses, of course, yeah. must be aware that um, the Messianic line is going to come through Judah. You know, we have that prophecy right. in Genesis 49, 10. Right. And that the whole story of Jacob and Tamar, and that's a very seedy story. <laughs> and another, it's another thing that, you know, we, w we wouldn't want to write our heroes being involved in stuff like this that but now the mother and the father of the ancestors of the messiah are involved in a situation of prostitution which ended up not being prostitution but her forcing uh, a descendant for her husband who died according to the the law which is later exposited in the torah you know where the brother takes his wife yeah so um even that story once again the the providence of god in seeing that this woman was going to have a child and that the child was going to be the ancestor of the king of Israel. <laughs> it's crazy. In Matthew, in Matthew chapter one, it, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Yeshua, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then in verse three, it says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, if I pronounce this correctly, by, right. by Tamar. And Tam right. Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. And, right. and as you say, brother, you know, I, I think I think that the earth looks for reasons to say that something is not legitimate based on our standard of morality. But there's something that so far supersedes it. When I think the fact that God chose Israel not because they were the greatest, but because they were the least, and then Yeshua comes and rather than setting up his kingdom, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and he washes his disciples' feet. 
And he says, the world and the nations lead this way, but I've not called you to have people serving you. I've called you to serve. And what, what many people do is they'll write off, they'll write off Israel they'll write off Jesus because they don't fit into their little paradigm. And if I was, if I was a church leader, quote unquote, in that day, I probably would have excommunicated Judah (laughs) or excommunicated Tamar. And yet in God's sovereignty, they're in the ancestry of our Lord. That is, well, um, well, go ahead. Amazing. Now you rightly would have had him step down from being the pastor of a congregation. Okay, absolutely. A prostitute, but, <laughs> yes. but, but, you know, there, there was uh, a fact of the denial of producing an heir for his sons. Now that you go to the father to produce that heir, that is outside of the boundaries of the law. Yeah. But Judah saw that his refusal was so bad that she's not going to be penalized for this and mm. he's going to bear with it. Amazing. So, it, it, it is amazing. And, and the fact that the Lord himself allows this in his, like, like if, 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 if Jesus did an Ancestry.com today <laughs> and, and it points him back to Judah and Tamar, um, you, you know, I, 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 get, I, I, I get that he was born from above and all of that, but in, in our natural eyes, he would have been disqualified. I, I love the point that you, that you made in your, in your uh, Parsha where you said God's working even among sinful people to bring about his purposes. And I want to take just a slight little detour, if you don't mind, because I do think it's very, very much um, relevant to today. But Dan, there are people that are writing off Israel today as the recipients of God's promises because they are, they're saying, well, Israel rejected God and And Israel can't be anymore the inheritors of those promises. And now the promise goes to the church because the Lord now looks at the church because of Israel's failures. In in just a couple minutes, could you respond to that before we move on with our with our portion here? Yes. Well, you know, many people have said, and rightly so, that if God rejected Israel because of its failures, he would certainly reject the church for its failures. So. Um, I don't think that the fail- failures of the church are any less than Israel. Um, and yet God is completely committed to his church and says that ultimately the church will triumph and be purified. And it's committed in a very parallel way to Israel. Yeah. Now, of course, we read the Bible straightforwardly, and we therefore can explain away the promises to Israel by a... Um, uh, a misinterpretation of what the New Testament is saying, and then we filter out all the texts that tell us about Israel's ultimate destiny in the Bible and say it doesn't mean Israel anymore. Mm-hmm. It means the new Israel, the church. Well, you know, that is such bad um, thinking. It's such bad use of the hermeneutics or interpretive principles and how you're willing to uh, to- play fast and loose with the authorial intent of the text. Yeah. But if you look at church history, when the Reformation came about, you, you'd, you'd say, well, this is glorious. I mean, look at this Reformation, but look at the church that they came out of. I mean, it was full of immorality. It was full of indulgences. It was full of idolatry. It was so corrupt that even the Catholic Counter-Reformation said the church was totally corrupt and they had to clean it up. Mm. And then, and, but, you know, you think we're doing well with the Reformation, and there you have Luther— who's the great hero, goes off into anti-Semitism at the end of his life, right. which, is a seed, which is a seed that could be used by Hitler in the Holocaust. Right. So we don't have this pure church. We have pure people in the church. Yes. And it is, as one writer said, church history is the glory and the shame. Mm. There's lots of glory, but there's lots of shame. Mm. And Jewish history is the same thing. There's lots of glory and there's lots of shame. Yeah. And because because they're human beings, and human beings uh, do not live up to to their callings, and it, it's always the few, it's always the minority that really reflects the godliness of of God and Yeshua and His principles. I love that. And so, yeah, and so what we get with Joseph is he ends up turning out to be this amazingly righteous man, forgiving his brothers, and of course, his suffering and restoration. It's an image of Yeshua. Yes, it's a foreshadowing, and many people have seen that. That's why even rabbinic Judaism talks about 
the, the suffering Messiah in Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12, who is pierced, is, is called Messiah ben Joseph, that he suffers in the image of Joseph before Messiah ben David comes. But we know it's the same one. Mm, amazing. So, so, so there we have, you know, Joseph, who, uh, this is the other thing, you can have very sinful people, but you can also have people that were foolish who end up being extremely wise after they learn the lesson. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting to me because the very next thing that happens where Joseph's concerned, he, he might have been foolish in telling his brothers the dream, but then he does something very, very wise when Potiphar's wife comes into him day after day after day. And one of my favorite three, one of my favorite verses and three words in scripture is Genesis 39, verse eight, where it says, but he refused. And that's talking about Potiphar's wife coming in to Joseph every day saying, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. And day after day, he refused. So here he goes from doing something foolish with his brothers and he's thrown into a pit. Now he does something very wise and he's thrown into prison. It seems like Joseph can't win. Had Joseph sinned with Potiphar's wife, it may have seemed like a, a the right thing to do rationally because she would have been on his side and they could have kept it secret. Right. Uh, so he's a, But he's accused nevertheless. But here's where we see that Joseph... Um, uh, has this sense of righteousness and trust in God that somehow doing the right thing will ultimately be rewarded. Amen. And what's great about Joseph is that we don't read about him convetching in prison and getting upset and <laughs> saying, God, I did the right thing. Why have you let me be imprisoned? And, you know, right. you know, a lot of times that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll look at uh, really bad circumstances that happen after we do what the right thing is. And then you know, Joseph says, well, God's going to bring good out of this. He's going to trust God. He's going to trust that this is going to bring about uh, something wonderful, just like, you know, Paul and Silas, uh, they're singing hymns in jail instead of convention against God. Why That's are we right. in jail after we've served you? Right. They're singing hymns, and it brings about the planting of a church. I so, love it. Right? Uh, Similar. Yeah, I love it. And there's a couple of times in Genesis 39 where it says the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph that despite his natural, uh, seemingly bad circumstance, God was there and in his divine sovereignty working everything out. And um, just in our, in our final few minutes, brother, I, I would love just for you to speak to our listening audience as one who moved his family over to Israel, who's laboring in the land of Israel, who sees that the Lord himself can't return until Israel welcomes him back. Because in the same way that Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him, Israel yet does not recognize Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah. Just in, in the final closing minutes, if you have an exhortation for the church where Israel's concerned and, and how, we can, how we can stand with Israel and provoke Israel to jealousy, I'd love for you to just speak into that for the final few minutes. Yes. Well, about 30 years ago, I did come to the conclusion that the ultimate battle for the souls of the Jewish people would be fought out in Israel, not in the diaspora. As much as I'm still involved in the Messianic Jewish movement in America and in several other countries, the center, the center of the battle for the heart of our people is going to be Israel. And so it was a privilege to move there. And sure, it's a lot more difficult to live there with the kinds of opposition that we have. And it's not just we who moved, amazingly, all of our children were led by the Lord to move there. So we have three children with us and 11 grandchildren. They're all in the work of the Lord. But, but you know, we, we are really believing that what's going to happen in Israel, and it hasn't happened yet, we pray for it daily, is that there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like in the book of Acts, and that we are going to see a signs and wonders movement that's going to produce a mass movement of Jewish people for the Lord. Right now, we're growing steadily, but just little by little, you know, a few here and a few there. Still, the number is growing, but we're looking for a mass outpouring of the Holy Spirit through prayer. And when that happens, there'll probably be opposition, but it's ultimately going to rise to a national consciousness. Who is this Jesus figure? And when that national consciousness is right, 
And when the church is in right alignment with the Jewish people and the Messianic Jews of the land, things will be set up for the last battles and for Israel to call upon Yeshua and to bring about that that revelation and return of the Lord and the redemption of the world. So we, we you know, we're there with all that it costs us to be there because we have this great vision of the return of the Lord to Israel and the redemption of the world. So that's the center for us. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast today. For more information about Together for Israel and the work that we're doing in the land of Israel, please visit our website at www.togetherforisrael.org. We look forward to you joining with us next week on another Portions podcast.